Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the uh, Cinema Tech. Thanks for coming tonight to what is uh, officially a sold-out screening. We haven't had many of those in our history. <laughs> Uh, undoubtedly going to be some latecomers, so please, if you see them wandering you know, the aisles, direct them to an empty seat. I see empty seats around here, uh, but they're a little hard to find in the dark, and we can't afford ushers here, so, uh, so we depend on you. Um, I'm John Ewing, the director of the Cinematech, and that's Genevieve Schwartz, the assistant director. Um, and I want to just, um, well, first of all, tell you that we're here every weekend showing films, not always to such big crowds. Um, but we'll be back there tomorrow, uh, and Monday actually, uh, this week, showing films. Tomorrow at 3.45 we show a movie called The Big Sky, a 1952 western by uh, Howard Hawks. Kirk Douglas is the star. We're showing it from 35mm film, which we can still do here, uh, and do at least once a week. Um, 3.45 if you want to see it. 6.30 in my night is the film you just saw the preview for, The Gardens of Pete Udall guy who designed the High Line in New York City. Uh, and then at 8, I think it's at 8.15 uh, tomorrow night, a movie called Genesis 2.0, which you also might have seen a trailer for, about people who harvest, uh, you know, woolly mammoth tusks in, like, Siberia, and then taking the people who are trying to maybe clone them uh, and recreate that extinct beast. Uh, Monday night, we're showing the uh, Japanese film Shoplifters, which won the top prize at last year's Cannes Film Festival. Uh, it was also one of the five Oscar-nominated Best Foreign Language Films this year. It will be presented by Linda Ehrlich, who uh, is a scholar of Japanese cinema. Linda, you taught at Case for many years. She now she kind of retired last year and now lives out of state. Uh, but she'll be back Monday night to uh, introduce that film and then also lead a discussion afterwards. Linda uh, did the DVD commentary on the movie Mavaroshi, which is the first film by Hirokazu Koryeda, the director of Shoplifters. So Linda knows more about this director than probably any, you know, any American, I would say. She's also interviewed him a couple times, and she's actually working on a book about him. And he's a major Japanese filmmaker. Uh, so anyway, it's a, it's a nice, uh, nice night at the movies. Not just a movie, but, uh, you know, especially been around an expert um, on top of it. All of those upcoming presentations are described in our current schedule. We publish these every uh, two months. Um, you need to become a Cinema Deck member to receive these in the mail, but um, we do send out an e-blast every week. If you'd like to get on our email list, over by the candy dish you'll find forms. Just give us your email address. Please print legibly, and we will add you to our e-blast, uh, which goes out on Tuesdays and always contains a discount offer in addition to reminding you about what, we'll, what films we're showing. Uh, the, you know, the following weekend. And we do show five or six different films every week, so it's quite, it's a lot to keep track of. I can't even do it. So, uh, so anyway, you need either this or the email or check the website or whatever. But we do show great unusual films all the time. And Stiv is a prime example, and I, I do want to thank uh, Mick McEwen, who was the first, who approached me about showing this film. This was like months ago, I want to say like in the fall. You know, he was asking about March 23rd. I didn't even know if I'd be alive on March the 23rd. <laughs> um, but the date was available. We locked him in. And uh, it's all come to pass, I guess. So uh, so anyway, thanks to Nick for approaching the Cinematech uh, about hosting this world premiere of Stiv. And it actually plays in London tomorrow night. That's what we like. So they wait, they wait to believe <laughs> Okay, we usually do a giveaway before the show, but we're not doing it tonight because your tickets don't have numbers and nobody cares anyway. So, <laughs> so anyway, we'll just move on with the main event. I do want to ask you, though, to turn off your cell phones before the movie starts and don't use or check those phones during the film. That's very, very important. It's a real distraction when a light pops up in the audience in the middle of the movie. All eyes focused on this screen only, please. Um, and there are other, there's a panel discussion here, but I'm not going to tell you about that. Let me just introduce um, Howard Kramer, who is uh, going to moderate the panel discussion. Um, Howard uh, was for many years a curator at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He's now, um, he isn't doing that anymore, but he is like a freelance, you know, museum consultant. Uh, he's uh, still a museum curator, and he's an author, and he's here tonight with Stiff. Please welcome Howard Kramer.
Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, as John said, this is the world premiere. This is the first public screening of this motion picture. Um, one of the wonderful things about it, it is a Cleveland story, a Youngstown story. There's a lot of people from uh, Cleveland and Youngstown here tonight. I'm sure a lot of you are seeing faces you haven't seen in many, many years. And it's great how, through all these years, art continues to pull us all together. So uh, I hope you all have a chance to really enjoy this. Um, when the film is over, we're going to have a little panel discussion. We're not just showing furniture out here on the stage tonight. Um, several of the people who are on screen tonight uh, will be here. David Quinton, Eddie Best, Frank Sussick, and Jimmy Zero. And I will be uh, having a conversation after the film. So. Um, so if you would, uh, when the film is over, when uh, we're going to be running for the credits, if you need to go to the restroom, that'll be a good time. We'll give it a couple of minutes, and then we'll uh, do the uh, do the panel. We'll probably do a little Q and A as well. So if you have some questions, well, make sure it's a question and not a statement. We like them in the form of a question. It's a real question. Uh, and again, as you support local music and you support music, also support great local art cinema. The Cinematheque is a real jewel of the city. So, without any further ado, Stip. So before we get started, um, I want to say, uh, how did, did you guys enjoy that? Yeah. First uh, I want to say, uh, uh, no, the uh, director Danny Garcia, who is not here, who, who uh, spent several years of his life trying to get this made, a uh, gentleman from Spain who is passionate about this project, and uh, so let's give a hand to Danny, who's not here, but he's certainly enjoyed this project. Uh, and also to the uh, producers of this, uh, Nick McEwen, uh, Jeff Redding, Jeff Redding's here, and of course, Frank Sessions is uh, one of the producers as well. So, it's, uh, it, it took the time to make this thing happen. Yeah. You gonna join us? Let me start with that. Uh, we'll sit there. Okay. So, uh, just one second. It's been a while since I've done one of these, so you got to give me a little bit of a break into it. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, you saw these guys speak, but once again, um, all the way to my right, uh, David Quinton was a young but experienced drummer when he first encountered Stip Baders in the late 70s. He played in the Canadian group The Mods and uh, opened for the Police, the Selector, the Squeeze, among many other groups. Uh, in 1979, at age 17, David moved to California and became, became Stiff's drummer. They worked together for several years, and David appeared on many of Stiff's solo recordings after he left the group to, to Toronto. Excuse me. <laughs> 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 a key to it. He released a solo record, played drums in the Canadian band The Jitters and Strange Advance. He's currently an attorney practicing entertainment law in Toronto and continues to make music. Please welcome David Quinn. Uh, I think he'll be out here shortly, I hope. He's probably talking to someone out in the hallway. Uh, Frank Sessick. Uh, Frank met Stiv in 1967 and they became fast friends. He was the first person to bring Stiv on stage. Uh, Frank is a founding member of Blue Ash, who rather famously opened for the Stooges at their final show in Michigan in the 70s, which was captured on the uh, Metallic KO record. It'll be quite a uh, yeah. quite a night. Um, <laughs> Frank was Stiff's collaborator on the Bob, Bob Singles and Stiff's solo LP, Disconnected. He toured with various Stiff Baker's bands and lineups of the Dead Boys. His current musical project is The Deadbeat Poets. He's, as I mentioned, an associate producer of this film. This is Frank Sussman. <laughs> Playing musical chairs down there is Eddie Best. Eddie uh, first encountered Stiff when he saw the band Mother Goose play at his high school, correct? Uh, they met a few weeks later, and after Mother Goose broke up, Eddie and Stiv formed the Rocket Tomatoes, that we saw evidence of tonight. They reconnected several years later when both of them were in Los Angeles, and Eddie joined Stiv in the studio to participate in the sessions that produced the Bob singles and several other tracks that were released over the years, and many of them posthumously. Uh, once again, ladies and gentlemen, Eddie Best.
It's my immediate right. Uh, Jimmy Zero is a foundational musician in the Cleveland punk scene. Um, after Detroit and before New York City, it was Cleveland that turned music on its head, and this guy was right at the forefront of it. Um, a founding member of the Dead Boys, a longtime collaborator with Stiv. Please say hello to Jimmy Zero. <laughs> You guys are okay out there? Is that fine? Shh, 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 We can't. We have to turn them up, up there. Hello. Okay. Turn them up, please. Yeah, turn them up just good. a little bit, please. Thank you. Please turn them up. Turn them up, please. Thank you. All right. I have absolutely nothing to say, and I want to make sure the audience knows that by the time they leave here. <laughs> I'm sure you will. Uh, this has got to be a momentous occasion because Jimmy doesn't leave the house very much, and for him to come out for this is a pretty big deal, so... Uh, Can you leave the house if you look like this? <laughs> um, the interesting thing I found about this film is it, it begins at the end, and it talks about how peaceful and happy Stiff was. And you guys were fortunate to witness the entire arc of this guy's life, really. Um, I want to start, I guess, with... Frank, you knew him the longest, right? Yeah, probably. I knew him when I was like 15. And, and how old was he relative? I mean, he was a year and a half to two years older than me. Okay, so was he kind of like the cooler guy you wanted to be like? or were Yeah, he, he was hanging guys? around with a, a, a lot of the, you know, uh, hippie type beatnik guys at the college and everything. And we would go to this one house that was there, and that's where I met him at. And this is at Youngstown State? It, Youngstown, it was Youngstown University at Youngstown State, yeah. Okay. I lived in a big house there, and it was kind of freewheeling thing going so on. Were you, and you were still in high school this time? Yeah, I was still in high school, yeah. Were you playing guitar? Yeah, I was already playing guitar. So how did how did you guys discover music together? What, what, what was the thing that really connected uh, you? We guys? started talking, and we would see each other at um, teen dances. There were carousel teen dances, kind of like the Hall of Blue Clubs that were in Cleveland, mm -hmm. all around Youngstown. So I would see him at all of those places. We'd go see the human beings, uh, the Holes in the Road, Pipe Pipers, all these great bands that were there. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I still even had a lot of pictures when I would visit his mom and dad quite a bit after he passed away. And his mom would bring out all these old pictures that he had taken of the you know, human beings, pipe pipers and everything. And I posted them on my site. So many amazing stuff that I didn't even know he had. But from back in those days, there's a whole gang of us that hung out together. And so, and you're, you're also from Youngstown. Ah, so. uh, from Sharon, PA, right, right across the border. You're from Sharon. Yes. And Eddie, you're from Youngstown proper. Mm -hmm. So I, I remember in a conversation with Tim Markula and the Human Beings many years ago, talking about how there really was a scene there, that there was something that was very self-sustaining. Uh, um, how did that inform Stiv and, as well, and you guys as well, Eddie? How did, how did that local scene really inform you guys? Well, there was a lot of bands. There was a, you could actually go out and make a living at it. And there was serious musicians, and it was oh, great for me. I was growing up and watching all these bands. And I wanted to be like these cats. Um, I used to see Frank's band all the time, Blue Ash, very popular. Yep. James Gang with Joe Walsh. And I'd see these cats, and I'm like, holy shit, you know, it's, I want to be like that. So, Maters influenced me when he had the Mother Goose thing going on. I thought we said no swear. <laughs> Did we say that? I didn't anything about no swear. I didn't hear that. <laughs> We're all adults, so it's, it's called call for language, is perfectly fine. <laughs> <laughs> Next time, save the microphone, Jim. Uh, so, Frank, you're, of, of all these guys, you're the first guy to really be a professional musician, correct? Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah, probably, yeah. Okay, so where, when you and Stiv started playing music together, where was that in terms of relationship with Blue Ash? After? Um, after Blue Ash, and right as the Dead Boys were breaking up, 78 or so, we started writing songs together. He, came, he would always come home for the holidays and call me. We'd always get together. So it was a much later thing. Yes, right. yeah, so collaborating. But he, his band, Mother Goose, opened up dozens of times for Blue Ash. We were always trying to Yeah, in the film, it talks about Mother Goose being this legendary group. How many, I mean, did they really play a lot? It was every show was chaotic is what we saw there. Yeah, they, they were like that. Uh, I... I I was actually a, a, an original member of the Mother Grease Band. In 1968, we played in Geneva on the lake all summer. But we were a cover band, a soul and psychedelic cover band. After I left, Stiv was my replacement. <laughs> so there, and then they became they, what you saw in the film. So there was yeah. a, little bit of a, a little bit of a change. Right? Yeah, a lot of change. <laughs> now, they had to have attracted an audience that they continued to gig. I mean, it, it seems to me that there was something going on there in, in the Mahoney Valley that 
didn't translate out of it at that time. Is that correct? Youngstown, you could always find an audience there. It, it, no matter how bizarre you were or crazy, and you play at the same clubs, there'd be 10 different bands that would play regularly there. And they draw different audiences to the same club, like the Freak Up. I mean, they just fit in. Youngstown was very open minded. And then, I mean, you were certainly a participant in that. I mean, do you, do you, do you have, the, have a similar opinion about that? I totally agree with Frank. Yeah, there was a very diverse musical thing going on. They used to have uh, teen dances on Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon at these clubs. So below 18, you could go see these same guys. And then Saturday night, they'd play for the over 18ers. So they do two shows in a day. Yeah, yeah there was absolutely. There was show in the absolutely. afternoon, and then uh, uh, you didn't see the James Same Cole club. Again. Awesome. Same club. Yeah. That's, that's really that's really remarkable to think like now how difficult it is to even find a place to play, and then you had to do two shows a night, mm -hmm. just to, or a day just to satisfy the audience. Yeah, and it was great because they would, yeah, the younger kids, the high school kids or whatever couldn't get in in the evening. We could go see this stuff, so it was totally cool. I mean, it was just amazing. They don't do that anymore. It's a shame. <laughs> it, it is kind really? of because it, it, the you, kids today don't have the chance to enjoy live music unless it's Ariana Grande for one hundred thirty dollars a ticket. <laughs> Um, it's kind of a drag in that sense. Um, so you then and Siv form a band after this after Mother Goose does its trajectory. Yeah, yeah, I saw them. They played my high school. I think I was 16. He was like 22, 23 years old. And I find out where he was living in this old dilapidated mansion. Frank talks about it. it's in the movie. And uh, I met his cousin at my high school, and he goes, "Just go down there and talk to him." Because I wanted to meet him. We saw him at the show at the high school after a basketball game. He's just go there. After a basketball game? After a basketball game on a Friday night. Makes all sense in the world. We played like one set, you know. And uh, so I went to his house and the door was open. I remember that guy Harry told me, just go in, knock. If they don't answer, just walk in. It was like a band house, an old mansion. And then all these guys were living there and girls. And uh, we found his room and went in and, and I introduced myself to him. And I said, I really like your music, and you, I thought you were great. He said, come on in, thank you, you know. And so we start talking, and I said, I have a little band. I want you as our singer. Right, I was like 16, right? He goes, yeah, thank you, yeah, you know, but, yeah, maybe. So he's still a mother goose. But he said, just keep in touch. So we always kept in touch, and he invited me down next week for a party. And he would always tell me where he was playing and come and hang out. So I was hanging out with him. So a couple years later, mother goose finally broke up. He goes, so you still want to get a band together? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so we did our little rockin' tomatoes thing for a while, and that w maybe lasted a year, if that. And then he was sick of Youngstown, and that's when he moved to Cleveland. He said, "I gotta go," and he left. And that's when he kind of ran into. And he ran into yeah. Jimmy and Jim. cheated and all these guys. Yeah. yeah. So you wanted to be a musician. You're not originally from Cleveland, am I correct? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. But I think you're from Columbus or Cincinnati. Right? Right. No. Yeah. I'm from Cleveland, I promise. Okay, sure. <laughs> I have this notion that you You think people brag about that around the country? <laughs> In this room, they sure as hell. <laughs> yeah, no. I, you know, if I could derail you for one second, sure, go ahead. I would like to personally thank everybody here. Yeah. Um, it means so much to me personally. Still would have been 70 years old this year. And thank you for coming out and celebrating his life. That means the world. <laughs> So you're this guy in Cleveland, in a town full of cover bands and places where it's hard to play original music, and at that time, there's really something starting to happen, in a, in a true underground sense, um, with uh, Electric Eels, Rocket, Rocket from the Tombs happening, or just starting to, and you're there, and then you and Stiv be, what, I mean, what was that like witnessing that happen, those bands? To create an awkward analogy, it was like going with a, a string of women, or in the case of the ladies here, a string of men, that you really didn't care about. And I had played in bands for 10 years before I met Stiff, and they were bands basically, I mean, due to my own fault too, I'm not blaming other musicians, that I really didn't care about. And then when I met Stiff, I wasn't sure what he was all about because he was so crazy. The sh shit he told me the first night I met him, I can't even repeat here. I just can't. It scared Actually. me. No, I can't. It, it, scared, it scared me. Try. But anyway, the stuff Howard's referring to is, is that you saw the potential 
in these bands that were forming in the underground and kind of like sticking their heads up every now and then. You saw the potential that there were bands that were going to happen that you could be in love with, to be a dead metaphor to death. And Rocket from the Tombs was the band for Stiv and I. We would go see them. They thought we were a gay couple. <laughs> um, we would go see them, and we would watch what they do. And I was watching them in a totally different way than Stiff. I was admiring what they did artistically. Stiff was looking at them, thinking, how do I blow this up and sit through the, the debris of the explosion and take what I want from it? And that's precisely uh, what he was thinking. Which brings it to a point that I wanted to get to with, with Stiv is he had a way of, say, he would infiltrate bands, right? But he would infiltrate people. He could create this appealing person to whoever he wanted to appeal to. Uh, David, I want to you know, bring you into this, that you were kind of on the outside in a sure. way. You're, you're literally a foreigner in this. Um, how, I, how I got made fun of a lot for being a foreigner. These guys, yeah, a, these guys would make fun of me for being Canadian all the time. Um, be proud. I don't remember that. Yes, you did. I made fun of you. We made fun of your small penis. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. I thought that was a good I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No rise to the I'm kidding. No rise to the <laughs> Don't take the bait with this guy. Ever. So, so David. You are you're brought in from you know another world, literally. You, yes. You know Canada has it had its own somewhat insular music scene. It was hard for American bands to come over, oftentimes to play. There was no reason sometimes for Canadian bands to come to the U.S. because there was already a circuit. How right. did you get tied up with this, and what soul do you want it, and also sold your parents to allow you, seventeen-year-old mm, baby? Parents, oh boy. Well, you know I met Steve. Um, at a club in Toronto where my band, the Muck, turn off that fucking phone. Uh, <laughs> Did you die here, John, before things started? Uh, so I met Steve at a, at a club in Toronto where my band, the Mods, were playing. And y you have to realize, like, at, at my age, um, 16, 17, uh, Steve was a rock star, um, as was Jimmy. I, I owned Dead Boys, Young, Loud, and Snotty. It was my favorite punk album. Um, so these guys were, were stars to me. The first time I met Jimmy, I was like, wow, oh, it's Jimmy Zero. Like, it was a whole time from there, I assure you. And that's despite the earlier comment, you know? But, but I, uh, uh, it was a big deal for me to meet Steve. He was stumbling drunk the night I met him, and he, and he said, I want you to play with me. And I was like, okay. And I didn't hear from him for several months, and um, then he called me one day and said he had tickets for Los Angeles. Uh, to go and play with uh, and record with Eddie and Frank. And um, my mother uh, had seen some dead boys uh, material in some rock and roll magazines that I had lying around the house. And she said to me, I want to talk to this stiff. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, now I had already been on the road quite a bit by that age, so it wasn't like shocking for my parents that I would go away, but nonetheless. Stiv got on the phone with my mom, and he was like Eddie Haskell from Leave It to Be. <laughs> he was absolutely, impeccably charming. And he said, I want you to know we will look after David. You don't have to worry at all. We will take care of him. And then she hung up the phone, and then he told me what was really going to happen when I got to LA. Which brings me to, so how did you guys take care of David? This was hinted at at some point. Um, when do you guys go first? Because I'm sure there's a lot there's a lot to dish here. Go ahead, Jim. Stiff the first few days on the road David was writing he would stay in, in the hotel while we were destroying whatever city we were in. He's hiding right now, by the way. Just and he would write letters to his girlfriend back home in Toronto. He was a nice guy. A person that Actually, Stiff and I should have looked up to him, but we didn't. And Stiff took me aside, he was watching these letters back home, and it was kind of like a mosquito was flitting around Stiff bothering him. Like, what is this? 
Oh, it's character. It's a good person. What, what's wrong here? And he, told, he actually told me, he goes, watch what I do. I'm going to corrupt David. And I will leave it up to David if you want to hear what happened next. I'm not going to tell you. Well, you know how they were talking about how he would exaggerate people's ages. Uh, one thing he used to do is if um, girls would come backstage, he would lie about my age and he would tell them I was a virgin. <laughs> Just so he could see what would happen. Um, that was his sense of humor. But these guys were, were older than me. Steve was 11 years older than me at the time. And um, when I went down there, I looked to them to basically be the parents. Um, my big brothers, and what I found out is that is that Stil and Frank were basically clinically psychotic, and and then I got zero, and he was even worse. There's got to be a tale here. I mean, what, was there a particular city where things turned? Turn, I I don't right? talk about other people unless people pay me lots of money. Uh, I I'll tell you one tale. Okay. Knew that was going to take one. We have been touring the West Coast and all over uh, Middle America. And we had been out with uh, Perubu, uh, members, magazine, all these And Stim and I were rooming together. We're in this big hotel. And we had been really, really, really drinking a lot. And Stim and I always room together. And I said, Stiv, I look out the window and I go, where in the hell are we? And he looks out the window. I don't know. So I said, we got a new phone, but I go to Seattle. But we just didn't know where we were. And we woke up in this room and it was like, that was it. That was Seattle. Does Seattle do that to people? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not certain. They have free buses but, but, there. Wow. Um, That's for free. <laughs> there, there's something that, that seemed to be um, common in Stiv's life, which is rather brief. Of course, he, he died at age 40. Um, was that most of these projects were kind of brief stands. Now, do you think that's, each one of you, I want to ask your opinion about this, is that his restlessness, or is that short attention span, or he just didn't find what he was trying to get to? Um, you know, Eddie, what, what do you, you got to say? Do you have two cents on that? Uh, I think it's all of that, what you just said, honestly. Short attention span, looking, searching, always trying to reach for something bigger, better, yeah. higher, faster, louder. You know, he was just always on the go. Guy was, um, I guess back then you call it OCD or hyperactive. He was definitely um, hyperactive. Yeah, and, and Frank and Jimmy, did you guys kind of like bookend things and also obviously, you know, cross over? I mean, what, what are your thoughts about that? Since well, Stiv, when I did an event over 10 years ago with Howard at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and he asked me when the Dead Boys saw the end of the road. And I said, when we first met, and the audience laughed. <laughs> but it wasn't me being cute or clever or funny. It really was like that. I thought, you cannot put these five individuals in a band and maintain it for very long. It's going to explode. And Stu wanted to keep the Dead Boys together, but we couldn't maintain ourselves. We were too uh, unstable. The, the drugs had entered in by then. Um, we were concentrating more on just maintaining rather than achieving artistically. Not that we were artists, but you know what I mean. Well, it seems like even just about all the contemporaries you had, save maybe Talking Heads, had virtually no commercial success during the time that they worked here. I mean, certainly the Ramones were infinitely more successful long after they, they uh, ceased to be a band. I mean, certainly long after Joey died, they became financially successful. Um, you guys kind of faced the same thing, though. Well, Stiv didn't quit the Dead Boys. The Dead Boys quit Stiv. Okay, as, as mentioned with uh, Cheetah and his, his issue. Yeah, it just fell apart. Like, actually, I think there was just um, inertia that kept it going as long as it did. Um, Johnny was stabbed right after our second album was recorded, and when I look back at that time now, 
we were really ready to call it quits as people, as individuals, before the second album was recorded. You could not live like we lived. You just can't. You'll go crazy, you'll die. Um, was that a function of being in a band or being in a band in New York at that time? I mean, you, you, you say in the movie about how difficult it was going back and forth from Cleveland to, to New York. Would Cleveland have been a better situation for you? No, because we took it with us wherever we went. It was in us. It wasn't where we were <coughs> geographically or what we were surrounded by. We brought that to New York. In fact, we were amazed when we first got to New York because we thought we were hicks from Cleveland. We came to New York and within like two or three visits we thought, wow, we can show these people a thing or two. <laughs> and it made me proud. Of, I'm not saying that. I'm not pandering. I don't do that. It made me proud of Cleveland because Cleveland was super hip at the time. And it also made me not fear New Yorkers and all that stuff. And we were way more out on the edge than any of the New York bands, um, with the exception of some individuals like Johnny Thunders. Um, You're talking about personal behavior or music? Yeah, just dysfunctional behavior that is self-destructive and will kill you. <laughs> and yeah, that, that all leads to the, yeah, the volatility and the creativity, the restless personalities. You know, these guys were wound up. And uh, yeah, they're searching and looking and you just, you know, you keep striving, you know, you're not happy. You just got to keep going. That's my take on it. Take the I, I would say like the, the time that I was with the guys, um, every day was something. There was something happening every day. If it wasn't a party, there was some big prank being played that Baders would be doing. Or there was always an event every single day. So basically, uh, the short period of time, you know, you spend six months or whatever, it feels like six years. That's just the way it was like. And I can't imagine what the original band was like. We were bored, and we did that to fight our boredom, David. Right. So we would do crazy stuff to just to break up the boredom and tedium of being in a band. Yeah. It was touring. Yeah. Well, these guys, I never laughed so hard in my life. I mean, it would be a, a riot every day. We got picked up. You, you remember, we got picked up at the airport in Burbank, and the ride home, and Jimmy out the window to every oh, single person on the street in L.A. I, I mean, literally, we were all in tears. You know, it, it was. He was so funny. Just every even, single even tonight, person, even tonight, you know, we were just about to take a picture with our uh, longtime friend Teresa Kiriakis. I said to Jim, are you going to smile or are you going to snarl for the picture? And he said, with my face, they can't tell the difference. <laughs> he is truly one of the funniest people that I know. Okay, this is what you're left with. <laughs> but to all the gray-haired people out there that have the same hair color as mine, congratulations, we made it. <laughs> to the people, this is what you have to look Now, I also wanted to just uh, point out, he'll kill me for doing this, but even though he's not on stage with us right now, uh, George Cabanis yeah. uh, is in the George Cabanis. George played on Disconnected and toured with us and down. Um, uh, he, he was and, and still is a, a phenomenal guitar player, one of Ohio's best. The one thing that gets uh, yes, yes, to tell you is that uh, uh, one thing that you guys are exhibiting is uh, a characteristic you see in bands, which is you kind of finish each other's sentences and each other's thoughts still, even after all this time. I mean, you guys haven't been together in a room in how long? That's because we're self centered. <laughs> I haven't, I, haven't seen Eddie, I haven't seen Eddie, I haven't seen Eddie, I don't think since 1980 or 81. We saw each other today and we had a drink and it was uh, really beautiful. I was so, so much looking forward to seeing him, seeing him again. Jimmy I haven't seen in uh, 12 years. Uh, Frank I see a little bit more often. And uh, he's, he's still my big brother, this guy, in, in every respect. When you go through the stuff we went through together, and you're a young guy like I was, it sticks with you uh, forever. He's still my big brother. Jimmy's my um, insane big brother. Um, if I, I actually had to room with Jim for a while on the road, that was, that was quite interesting um, and very enjoyable. And uh, 
Yeah, there's a, it's, it's very interesting. It's, uh, it's sort of like being on a hockey team together, I'm Canadian, or, or uh, you know, not, not to, um, you know, uh, de-emphasize the importance of military or anything, but there is something militaristic about being in bands, and, and you do form these incredibly strange and strong bonds, even after short periods of time. So I go through fucking law for any of these guys, even now, and I don't even know why. It's just the way it is. I, I, I've seen that many times and experienced it myself, but you're right. It, it, it is a thing. You go to bond that just nothing nothing can really break it, and it, it's just there. I want to ask, as musicians who played with Stiff, let's get back to the point that this is you know, about Stiff, what was it like watching him from the, from your vantage point? So, drawing, from my, my yeah, vantage point? Yeah, because you, you had to deal with a guy either assaulting your kid, uh, if you're trying to pay attention, maybe you're having issues with your tempo. I don't know, but what was it like from behind the kit? Well, first of all, I was, I was, I'll admit this, I was very frightened um, on stage with him a lot of the time because okay. he would do dangerous things to himself, and I would, I would think he's going to break something or he's going to break his neck or whatever. But, but sort of the, the things that come to mind when you ask the question, uh, you did see what he would sometimes do when he... <laughs> I called it the Dwight Taylor arrangement. But I was sounding an update. He was very well endowed. Uh, he you know, was the view I had. It looked like a dried fruit arrangement. It looked like a banana and it's a plums. And I would say, there's the dried fruit arrangement. Okay, how do we get through this? <laughs> the only other thing I'll tell you is when we were playing at the uh, Whiskey Go Go in Los Angeles, and during that era, some of the punks would spit. And, you know, Steve was very. He just knew it was going to happen, so he didn't care. And he would stand at the front of the stage and spit would come, and it would sort of cover him. Or, but I was always in the back thinking, ah, oh, shit, I really hope his spit doesn't hit me. Because some of these people could spit far, you know? <laughs> so I was counting in a song like this, and boom, I feel this little thing in my head, and it was hanging and dangling from my head like that. And I had to play the front of a song like that. Yeah, yeah. That's the perils of being in a band with Steve Davis. <laughs> one, one time, Mark, uh, we, we were playing on, on stage, and I never knew where he was at, because he'd be all over the place, right? And I would jump all over the place, and I had a big Fender bass, and all of a sudden I turned real quickly, and he came up, and I hit him in the back of the head, and knocked him out of the hole. You know, we take him off, we're in the, in the dressing room, and he goes, did it look cool? <laughs> I go, yeah, it was great. And I never saw him. I just turned and clapped his face. <laughs> yeah. And that set ended right there. Done. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Eddie, you got one? Oh, I, I enjoyed watching him. I honestly would just lay back, play the guitar, and watch him go. And it was really entertaining for me. And I was happy to be with a guy who would just like go for it. And I, I did enjoy it. And, and Jimmy with the Dead Boys, and actually the footage from CDGBs I thought was pretty amazing as well as the, the Frankenstein footage. The fact that the Frankenstein footage exists is kind of blows my mind, but the, the CDGBs footage, it's, it's not, you know, Stim is out there, he's right out in front, but the band is also out there. You and, you and Cheetah were also part of this, you know, full throttle assault. What was it like trying to get that dance down? Between, did it occur naturally, or you guys... No, I took practice. It was like a... I don't know about Cheetah, but I always was aware, even when I resented it, I was aware of who the star of the show was. It wasn't me, it was the guy to my left. So my job was to get out of his way. And I learned how to do that. I could sense his behaviors. Like, if he did this certain dance move, and it wasn't rehearsed or anything, if he did this certain body language, it was like, okay, he's coming over here. I'd, pass up. I'd move my guitar over so he didn't bump, detune my guitar. And you just, like, if you were paying attention, you instinctively learned that. <laughs> at, the, at the end of the, the movie, there's that, that scene with, um, it's the end of the beginning. It's, it's, it's Stim and Carolyn walking down the hall, and he says, when you love someone, you can love yourself. Stim obviously had some issues with depression. He had some issues with committing to music, uh, even even let guys go free. Uh, the bass player in the Lord's like, oh, you want to go play another band? Great. It's cool, man. Which is not a common occurrence. 
the, the loving yourself. Do you, do you think he really found that? Because at the end, like we're talking about the beginning of the movie is the end of his life, and he seemed to have found peace. What's, what's your take on that, guys? Dave, want to start with you? Um, oh, boy. Uh, when you were talking earlier about how he would have these short bursts, these periods, um, with different projects, you know, I, I was telling my wife recently um, at Gramercy Park uh, Hotel in New York, um, Brian James had come and joined us at the end, just before Lords of the New Church started, and Brian um, said to me in the bar, I, I, we, we need you to come. Um, and we want you to play in this band that we're starting and going to London. And I looked at Stu and I looked at Brian and I went, no way, I'm not going anywhere. And I told Frank at the time, and I stayed here, maybe that was a mistake not going, but I think in, in certain respects it saved my life. And I, I, don't, I don't know what happened in the last few years. The last time I heard from Stu, it was a chain letter that he sent to me. And it didn't have any writing on it, but I recognized his writing on the envelope, and the stamp was upside down, which was his trademark. So it had my name, my address, the stamp upside down. I opened it up, and it was one of those chain letters that said, if you don't send it to however many people, you know, bad luck will come. And I knew it was him. And I think that might have been, uh, I don't know, maybe a year before he passed away. And the night he passed away, it was Frank who... Uh, who called me and told me I'm still greatly affected by it. Do you think he said that chain letter to just, as they say, take the piss out of you, or he was very serious about that? No, I think it was his sense of humor. You know, he had a, he had, um... So I just want to pull one out of your wrist. Yeah, I mean, he had a hysterical um, prankster sense of humor. Um, we could sit here all night and tell those stories. Um, but he also had a dark sense of humor that could come out at times as well. I mean, I, as an adult now, because I wasn't then, I realized that he was a very complicated character. I think he was um, an incredibly intelligent man, and I think he had all kinds of issues, all kinds of issues. And if you, when he passed away, I remember saying to people, um, look, Stiff was not going to become a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant. Stiff was not going to deliver Kentucky Fried Chicken. Stiff was not going to work at a McDonald's. I think he instinctually knew. Though he did. That when he was a teenager. Was a son. That this was. No, you know, you're, you're right. There's some guys you look at and you go, he's got to be a singer in a band. You know. Yeah, and, and there was an end to that. And I think he somehow knew when, organically, when that ending was coming. And, and Jimmy, you mentioned that in. In the film about he knew he he almost you said he kind of welcomed death, but there were health issues there that were that were lingering. Yeah, he was dying. Um, he had done so much damage to himself that he had like ten percent liver function, and I really, really, with all my might, wish I could look at this audience tonight and tell you that he had peace at the end of his life, but he didn't. He would. It was very sad for me to watch this. The uh, It was like a double-edged sword for me because he finally opened himself. He, I don't think he saw me as a threat to him anymore. And he exposed who he was for the first time in our entire relationship after all those years. Um, Carol, who I really liked, I got to know her real well, I really liked her, and I think she helped Stiv open up to me. In fact, when I, you know, what she was, pillow talk, or whatever they call it, where she was telling him things, you can trust Jimmy, he's okay. I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that for good reason, because he changed. But um, he was not at peace. He, I went out on the road with him in about 88 or so, and it was horrible for me personally. I'm not complaining about what someone else's tragedy did to me. Um, he was, he was. I said in the movie, he's like Elvis, and he really was. If we had three days off, he, Caroline would pump him so full of drugs that he would be in a coma, and he would wake up once a day and she would feed him. 
And if you wanted to talk to him, you had to get in during feeding time. And it was so different than the stiff that I toured with in the 70s, this really fun-loving prankster and all that. And when he called me toward the end of his life, he started to cry for the first time I had ever experienced him crying. He never would show himself. He was better than Vito Corleone. Never tell anybody what you're thinking. He was way better than Vito was. And uh, he would cry. And I was like, really? Another double-edged sword. I was so impressed and so moved by this trust that suddenly he had for me. But on the other hand, the things that he was crying about, I could tell he was on his way out and I didn't want to say goodbye to him. He was too young. Let me tell one more thing. Sure, sure. Can I just say, and he would not have said it, and I think he wants to contribute. Go ahead, please. I, I agree with Jim, with Jimmy Harrison. The movie, it's funny, I had a preview of the movie, and you hit it. I watched the movie at my home. Danny sent me a copy. I watched it. And when I heard Stiff say that, you know, you can't be happy until, you know, someone else. And that was like, wow. That was really uh, profound for me. It was, because I've been in therapy. And uh, it's like, wow, that's kind of all, put it all together for me. Because he's been a, a mystery or an enigma to me for years. I've had love and hate relationship with the guy for years. I've had a hard time figuring it out. Now I know. Stim was dead before he died. I'm not being clever. He was dead before he died. Are you referring to Stim, the character? Because there was a certain... The human, the human being. He was dead before he died. He was just going through the formalities, and the accident just made it simpler and easier and neater for him. But he was dead before he died. He, he knew it, too. He, when, um, I was waiting for him to commit, commit suicide, and I'm not being dramatic about someone else's life. Um, I was waiting for him to commit suicide. And when I heard that he died, I thought, he did it. And the worst thing, and I'll shut up the rest of the night, I just want to tell you guys something that's personal. I was at a friend's apartment, and the call came in there that he had died. And I thought, I'm about to enter into a shitstorm of media, people asking me what I think of his passing. So I had to go home. I went home. I had been there for about three days, and I put on my answering machine, and I pressed it, I figured out if somebody, if somebody, a reporter already called or whatever, and the first voice I hear is his. And we had this running joke, because I lived in Cleveland and he lived in Paris, that I lived in Mayberry. Then he would ask how Gomer and Gober and Barney were. And he's on my answering machine. He'd call two or three days before he died. And he's asking how Gomer and Gober are. And when I heard that, I can't even express to people what I felt. And I won't try. It was um, one of the top three or four moments of my life, and not in a good way. Um, that's, again, not to repeat myself or bore you. That's why I am so grateful that you've come here tonight. Thanks, Jim. Um, he was obviously a really complicated guy, but there was something about him that all of you clearly loved. And he brought you all together. I mean, at one just real, just so I'm clear, at one point was this the band you guys were were, were in the lineup? Um, no, it was uh, at one point the three of us, and then another point Jimmy Frank and I. But, now I just wanted to say that that he he changed all of our lives un unquestionably. Um, and he changed my life in a huge way. And you know, it's funny because, like I said, the, I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, but they're older than I am, and. Um, they were. It's an empirical they were, they were, they were, some Be careful, because you're looking like that age. You know. <laughs> In some cases, we're older than that. But the point is, is that, is that my, you know, my experience as, as such a young uh, person um, with with Stu, as opposed to uh, some some of the other guys who were adults already, 
Um, I had a lot of change left to do in my life, um, whereas a 30-year-old has maybe a little bit less uh, change. I went through, obviously, radical changes, but this guy uh, changed my life. I'm sitting here right now, um, 42 years later, whatever it is, four years later, and, and it's because of him. And um, I owe him so much. Um, yeah. he, 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 we all do, even though he could drive us completely mental. Um, but that's what made the guy who he was, and that's what made the experience of being around him so special, was his unpredictability. And like Jim says, when he's saying the human being, that wasn't an act. That was the guy. And the mystery for me, and I think for all of us, was always to try and find out who he really was. But you didn't get that opportunity very often, and it would just kind of poke through every once in a while through acts of kindness. I was very depressed on the road when I was young. We were touring, and he, he took me outside and brought his BB gun. Remember we had that high-powered BB gun that looked like a real gun? That's right. He's got it on the cover disconnected, and he put his arm around me, took me out, and he went, come on, let's go shoot out some lights. And I was like, I was like, really? And we, went, we went with that BB gun and we shot out some lights. And I'm not going to tell you what city it was, so I won't get in trouble. The statute of limitations is over, I'm sure. Um, before, I mean, I know we're running into some time here. I want to see if anybody, if there's some questions from the audience. I don't know if we have a, a microphone to, to share. But I, I, we'll, we'll let yeah, so you raise your voices. Uh, this woman here in the, uh, in the shawl, please speak up loudly. That was actually my idea. He was always late for every show, and he would procrastinate, and he would use it to, it was like a way of demonstrating power. And we'd, be, we'd all be ready to go to the show, and he would be in his hotel room, and he would be blow drying his hair, and sh he goes, I have to shave. That was always, I have to shave. And I go, Stiff, I go, why don't you go to the, it was a whiskey ago in L.A., and I go, why don't you go to the show and show up in a bath towel naked with a blow dryer that the roadies will plug into the drum riser and shave with a mirror on stage while we're playing our first song? <laughs> and he goes, that's a great idea. <laughs> Whenever people listen to anything I say, it's really dangerous. <laughs> the funny part of that night was that when we did the song, we did The Hard Day's Night by the Beatles, and we did a note for note cover of it. Jimmy sang the lead, I sang in the middle part in the harmonies, and, and uh, George Cavanagh had the Rickenbacker Chaucey bang on the money, and Stiff comes out with a hair dryer, no clothes on, he's on this stage drying his hair while we're doing uh, and shaving, doing a hard day's night, and he's slipping his pants on him, and we're, we're you know, when I yell. Because he actually got there on time. And because it was Los Angeles, no one got it. <laughs> he told me, to most Mark Twain's quote about Cincinnati, I'll change it to Los Angeles. Mark Twain said that he wanted to be in Cincinnati if the world ended, because it took them 10 years to find out about anything. <laughs> I want to be in that. Um, I, I remember that gig because he, he had his face full of shaving cream and with his sunglasses on and he had the towel on and remember the staircase at the whiskey, you know, you come down. So I'd say, I, I said, Peters, we, we gotta go, we're, we're starting. And he said to me, start Sonic Reducer, the first two notes, and just hang on to them. Don't, don't start. You know, ba ba. So we're holding, 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 holding. And then he came walking down, and when he was shaving on stage, he was throwing the cream. <laughs> and, and then uh, Aditi came on stage. I just handed him my base. I took the hair dryer, started drying my hair. Then I went up and had three or four beers. You guys were great. You know, I'm watching. I'm watching. Think, wow, I'm getting paid for this. I don't have to play. Aditi and drink. Aditi and John Jeff played this, and John Belushi. Yeah. And drums, for us. Fun, fun time. Uh, any other, another question? Uh, yes, still there in the red shirt. Uh, so, one of the other uh, band members who's not here, Cheetah, uh, did any of you play with him? What was, uh, what was the relationship he had with Steve? Uh, the question was, what was the relationship that Cheetah had with Steve? And I would guess 
I, I think that it was a very volatile relationship, to be honest with you. I think that Stiff felt that he needed she to fit into Stiff's paradigm of James Williamson, Iggy Pop, Keith Richards, Mick Jagger. Stiff really was focused on that. Lead guitarist, um, lead vocalist, and Cheetah really fit that bill because Cheetah was like really extraordinary. He was unique, and but Cheetah didn't always show up, and you never kind of knew who you were going to get. And Stiff didn't like that. Stiff really, contrary to what you might see in the film, Stiff was very, very demanding, and you better show up, suited up to play or he didn't like it. And Cheetah was brilliant, but he didn't always show up, and Stip didn't like that at all. I think they loved each other, though. You know, after all, all during that time, after all was said and done, they loved each other. Uh, any more questions? Any more? Did we answer every question? The all history has been raised here? We have a very curious crowd here in the tower era. Yes. George, would you come up just for a sec? Oh, just come up. Yeah. Thank you. This is George Kiyaka. He was on Stitch Disconnected album, and he was a member of the Dead Boys for a short time. And I'm really proud to have played with him. Thank you, George. He forgets you had sex in, the, in New Mexico. <laughs> so, George, you're, you're, we've covered a lot of distinct territory here, and you were almost mercenary in, in, a, in a sense. You were kind of brought in off the deep bench to fill in. Yeah, I got the phone call at 3 in the morning. We were at a roller disco, and she'd have broke his wrist, so you got to play with us tomorrow night at Max's Kansas City. And you were in Akron at the time? Uh, no, I was in New York. Oh, you were in New York. Okay. Yeah, my band, Hammer Damage, was opening up for the Dead Boys in New York. Okay. So, I just had to do that. I to play with them for practice with them all afternoon and played that night at Max's. <laughs> yeah, did an okay job. <laughs> and, as these guys were talking about the, this multiple personalities that you kind of experienced with Stiff, what was what was your relationship like with, with uh, Stiff? Uh, he was real professional with me, and he had that kind of big brother thing going on. You know, he is like, uh, you know, very nice, but he he kind of wanted to do the let's corrupt the new guy thing. <laughs> you know, that was, that was a recurring theme with him. You so, know? so it was like, <laughs> who can I pick on now? And uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's see what kind of, uh, how can I debase this person? <laughs> <laughs> and how did that, and how did that work out for you? Uh, yeah, not, yeah, I resisted him pretty well, so he, you know. George is basically Gary Cooper. <laughs> not, not, not Except George is Gary Cooper. Not bad. Well, uh, we spent a, a, no, a lot of time up here. I know that you guys have some stuff available uh, out in the lobby for sale. Uh, Frank has his book. Um, what else was there available? There were some photographs and some of the Dave's photographs. Dave Treats photographs. Teresa's uh, great work. And Teresa's photographs. Teresa's photographs. Teresa's photographs. Teresa's photographs. So, uh, once again, I want to thank every one of these gentlemen for taking time to come to town. Thank you. Thank you.